Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and a warm welcome from me, Victor Mills, and my team at SICC. Great to have you with us this morning. Um, today's webinar is um, of particular interest to all of those of you who understand arbitration um, and the alternative mechanisms to resolve disputes, but want to know a bit more about how, um, that, how we can resolve maritime and trade disputes uh, in a cost-effective way. And to tell us all about this, uh, I'd like to welcome our guest speakers today. We've got Mr. Punit Oza, who's the Executive Director of the Singapore Chamber of Maritime Arbitration, or SCMA for short. And he's joined by the Vice Chairman of the Chamber, Ms. Karina Song, who's also a partner with Allen & Gledhill LLP. And um, Alan and Gledhill are a member of SICC. So it's lovely to have a chamber member here to give a practical perspective of the work of SCMA. In a short while, I'll ask Puneet to um, begin his presentation. But before that, just a couple of housekeeping um, suggestions. At any time during um, the presentation, uh, please feel free to ask your questions using the Q&A function. Uh, for most of you, that will be in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Um, I will be back to moderate that Q&A, uh, but for now, what I'd like to do is to hand over to Puneet, um, and we can get started with this morning's webinar. Puneet, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much, Victor. Good morning, uh, all. Thank you very much to Victor and SICC and the entire team for helping us out with this webinar. Uh, good morning and welcome. Uh, it's really a, a privilege and a very, very uh, pleasure to be here with uh, all of you. And also my thanks to Purina Song, our board member, and uh, Alan Gladhill partner, who's actually helping us out in this regard. If I can just start off with the presentation, just one minute, let me just start with this. Yeah. Yep. So this is a topic which obviously is, um, is quite relevant to any uh, time, but especially during COVID-19, we have actually seen a definite uh, increase in uh, maritime and trade related dispute. I can see from the list of participants that a lot of the companies are either directly uh, involved with maritime and trade or have some kind of linkages with it in one form or the other. So it's great to actually be able to connect with potential users, current users, and uh, previous users of SCMA, hopefully, as well as I go along. So let me just <clears throat> start a little bit with introducing SCMA. Uh, our origin is about uh, 15 years ago, or 16 years ago, actually, when we were set up uh, as a specialist maritime and trade-related arbitration body within the SIAC. SIAC has uh, been in uh, existence for much longer, the Singapore International Arbitration Center. Uh, the model on which we based ourselves uh, even today is a different model than the SIAC model, but we started off with SIAC as being a part of it. In 2009, because the models had ugly converged into a different direction, we obviously uh, became independent, specializing in maritime and trade-related disputes with Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore, MPA, and Singapore Maritime Foundation, SMF, being the founding members. So over the next four years, five years, we actually had a, a committee overseeing the SCMA activities as we eventually moved into a formal setup uh, with board of directors coming on board. And uh, Karina, as I mentioned, is one of the board directors with us in SCMA. Um, last year, we celebrated the 10th anniversary since we became independent. And obviously, we have now established ourselves um, in a fairly secure position of being a specialist maritime and trade related arbitration body in Singapore, obviously servicing Singapore and beyond the shores of Singapore as well. Uh, the actual virtual background you see behind me is our office actually, we're Maxwell Chamber Suites, that's where we are. And that's the world's first integrated dispute resolution complex where the arbitration centers, arbitrators, um, and even some of the hearing facilities uh, are all provided in one single place, which is actually quite a benefit for being uh, in Singapore. So let me start straight away with the agenda. Um, I'll deal with a little bit on major types of maritime and trade disputes that are generally prevalent, but also specifically 
because of COVID. Um, and we can then expect analysis later on uh, when Karina can come in and give some practical examples that she's seen in recent times. We'd also talk a little bit about choosing the most suitable dispute resolution solution. Dispute resolution is something which is not on the top of the agenda for a lot of companies. Um, and it needs to be because obviously it's very important that you have the right kind of dispute resolution um, uh, venue as well as the clause as you go along. The other thing, of course, is where do you actually do your dispute resolution? The forum, the seat, understanding that is quite, quite crucial. Um, coming to SCMA specifically, I think there are certain contracts in which SCMA has a slam bang slam dunk suitability. It has very, very relevant to those contracts. Um, and obviously, it does have relevance to other contracts, but less so. Obviously, we would like to establish the suitability. And I'll give you some practical aspects of how to smartly use SCMA, because that's what we're looking at at the end of the day. We are trying to resolve disputes. We are trying to resolve them smartly and cost effectively. And finally, we will give, uh, we'll get Corina to come back and revisit some of the aspects of the presentation and give us some practical insights as to what the current disputes have been all about and how uh, we can smartly navigate that aspect going forward. So this is how the agenda looks like. Um, I'll be more than happy to answer questions after that um, once we are done with the presentation and Corina's uh, specific inputs. So disputes are very commonplace. It's not something which is unusual uh, to have disputes um, in business dealings. But what has happened with COVID is that we've actually had a whole new area of disputes which have actually sprung up. And this is a new normal. Uh, a lot of people are still getting used to it. A lot of things are still being clarified. But this is the new normal, whether we like it or not. The key is, how do you resolve them? How do you resolve these disputes efficiently and cost effectively? And that's the crucial part that we are dealing with here. This is to give you a perspective of what we are talking in terms of maritime and trade. 50,000 ships carry 90% of the $18.5 trillion annual world trade. So this is from Cargo Metrics and US global investors who have done this uh, analysis. And obviously this is a huge amount of business that's happening and it's a lifeline industry across the globe. Um, but there are a whole bunch of dispute areas, some of which are COVID centric, some of which have always been prevalent in past as well. Breach of contract is obviously always there, but it's been accelerated a little bit because of circumstances. Force majeure is the most common uh, new area which has uh, come back into limelight. Uh, the inability to perform your contract and then saying that it is circumstances beyond the party's control, force majeure. Frustration, um, the contract being frustrated because of, uh, because of COVID or other reasons. Of course, insolvency is not specifically arbitration related, but insolvency is becoming a bigger challenge as we have seen with some of the high profile court cases today in, uh, in maritime sector in, in uh, Singapore. And of course, delays in ports, which obviously is a knock on effect of COVID. Uh, you have logistics problems. You obviously have delays in ports because of that. You cannot clear your cargo in time. And then suddenly you have a bill in front of you from the ship owner and how do you manage these various aspects and disputes as you go along. So we'll talk a little bit more in detail when uh, Karina can come in and give a bit more practical insight on this going forward. I want to emphasize that some of the key clauses um, are the ones that you never get to use. This is a typical in any contract. I've been in commercial shipping for many, many years before I joined SCMA. And I know for a fact that you don't have these clauses, it's going to be a problem, but you never ever most of the time, you never get to use it. Let's hope you never get to use the dispute resolution clause as well. Um, little attention is paid to these clauses during the negotiations, which is a reality, which is a fact. Um, and that's why this kind of a highlighting is, is important from a perspective of trying to get the companies to be more aware. Um, it's too late to change the dispute resolution clause when a dispute arises. So a lot of people say that, yeah, but you know, when the dispute comes in, I have a clause, but we don't know what that clause is and you don't look at it and it's too late for you to change it at that point of time. I have seen in past uh, that a wrong clause can eventually incur a lot of expenses, uh, be in areas which are unsuitable to go and arbitrate or dis resolve your disputes and they could well be a very expensive affair. So it's important that people pay a lot of attention to these clauses and we'll talk a little bit about how 
SCMA is making it easier for people to be able to, or parties to be able to do this in an effective manner. There are lots of dispute resolution solutions outside the court arena, the alternate dispute resolution as they call ADRs. Um, some of them are non-binding, like the mediation and settlement conferences, uh, early evaluation uh, conferences that you can have. Um, and obviously that's something which is possible. Uh, parties need to have the will to actually sit down and resolve issues. And they are effective in some cases, but in terms of binding solutions, arbitration is the only alternate dispute resolution solution that's actually there. And the arbitration has a lot of benefits compared to going to the courts. So the value propositions for arbitration is a swift and cost-effective solution, avoids the litigation route, which can be uh, expensive and it can be quite long as well. It's a private and confidential procedure in most cases. And that is very important to remember because most of the businesses do not want the disputes to be in public domain because the knock-on effects can be really, really detrimental and it can actually do more harm than benefit the company. The other aspect is that it's a final and binding solution. As I mentioned, binding solution is very important. Um, the other aspect is that you can actually have an arbitrator who understands the subject matter. A judge may or may not be a subject matter expert, and that can be a challenge in some cases. Finally, how do you enforce these awards? Normally, the judgments are enforceable across jurisdictions. Uh, arbitration awards are also enforceable across jurisdictions through a convention called New York Convention, where which 164 countries so far have signed. So it's a fairly wide uh, applicability, and it is something which is uh, quite well tested as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about it later on. So this is why arbitration is the way forward, I would say. The next part is how do you choose the right seat and the forum for arbitration? The first thing that Singapore has always been as the forefront of international commercial arbitration for many, many years, it's always been in the top three. Um, but now as per the recent survey by Singapore International Dispute Resolution Academy here, uh, we actually were at the top of the preferred seat of international commercial arbitration this year. So it's really much a well-established venue. There are six areas which I would like to highlight why Singapore should be chosen as your venue in all your international contracts as well. Um, it's got user-friendly arbitration laws based on the UN model law. And also Singapore is a, uh, is a signatory to 100 and, uh, the New York Convention which, as I said, is signed by 164 countries, including China, where I believe certain foreign judgments enforcement can be a challenge, but arbitration awards are easily uh, enforceable. There's a lot of judicial support. Um, the quality of the judiciary is very high. And of course, there's minimal intervention in the arbitration process. It's an open regime because parties have freedom of choice of arbitrators, they can bring in foreign arbitrators um, and they can use any governing law uh, while using Singapore as the dispute resolution venue or the seat. There's a very rich talent pool. Please understand in maritime and trade related contracts, a lot of foreign laws are used, uh, mostly English law and maritime contracts. And there you have the ability for a lot of local firms who are having specialists in English law. Uh, and there's a fairly rich talent pool available here. Uh, most of the global law firms are represented here as well. So obviously that's something which is very beneficial for uh, the companies here. Tax incentives are offered from foreign arbitrators, uh, which is a very big benefit for them because they don't pay any taxes or withholding tax. And finally, as I mentioned, Maxwell Chambers is a one-stop shop for dispute resolution. And it's got world-class hearing facilities, including for virtual and hybrid hearings, which have become a lot more common with the COVID-19 situation. So this is why I would say Singapore is your chosen venue. Now, dispute resolution costs are unbudgeted expenses. So any deal that you have done, which has hopefully made profit, if you end up with a dispute at the end of the deal, you are ending up spending money from the profits. So you are actually hitting the bottom line straight away. Uh, that's why choosing the right form of model of arbitration in Singapore is important. So you, the choices that you have in Singapore are clear. It's a SCMA and the SIAC. When it comes to maritime and trade disputes, you do have an option to look at both of them. 
but the models are totally different from each other. The SCMA model is what is called the unadministered model of arbitration. It's a, it's a light touch approach and we do not administer the arbitrations um, on a structured basis. Uh, it's more suited for maritime and trade disputes. Pretty much all the global maritime arbitration uh, uh, models are similar to this very model. The unadministered arbitration effectively gives the parties and tribunal a lot more flexibility, a lot more control on the way the arbitration is conducted and structured. And of course, because the administrative involvement is low, the cost structure of the model is low as well. The SCMA model is similar to the London model, uh, but it's got a very strong Asian focus as well. The SIAC, on the other hand, is the administered model. It has its own rule of arbitration and obviously needs to be adopted by the parties. The SIAC has a lot greater role to play in the arbitration process and they administer it very closely. Considering that aspect, they are a much higher cost model as such. And that is something which obviously is also not that suited for maritime and trade disputes in general. Just highlighting four areas where SIAC and SCMA differ from each other considerably. First of all, when you start an arbitration process, um, you do have to um, pay a case filing fee and an administration fees, which is payable to SIAC. SCMA does not have any case filing or administration free. In fact, SCMA is a not-for-profit entity funded by a public-private partnership. So obviously, we are not really looking to make money on the arbitration cases itself. The other thing is that the cost of the arbitrators or the fees of the arbitrators are calculated as a percentage of dispute amount in SIAC. And the costs are finally determined by the registrar of SIAC. While SCMA leaves the parties to actually negotiate and agree the remuneration of arbitrators, therefore giving them more control, more autonomy. The timeline for servicing the case statements uh, are specified in the SCMA rules, so there's a clear predictability there. Although the parties are fully free to agree extensions if needed, but in case of SIAC, they are uh, determined, the timelines are determined when the tribunal is tribunal is constituted. So obviously that requires a little bit more of an unknown factor coming in. Finally, as I said, SCMA specializes in maritime and trade related disputes. We've got specialized procedures for maritime claims like bunker claims um, and collision claims. If there's a collision between two ships, there's a expedited procedure for that. We also have a auto access to quicker small claim procedures which obviously is available in SIAC as well, but it's subject to registrar's discretion. SIAC does not have obviously any specialized procedures because it doesn't deal with specifically maritime or trade related disputes as a specialist forum. I will just quickly glance through the three value prospects or value propositions that SCMA offers. As I said, it's a commercially focused body. Um, it's very much focused on maritime and trade related disputes. It's global membership base, about 185 individual and 45 corporate members are essentially made from all over the world, both specializing in maritime trade and legal profession. At the same time, we also have local users council now, uh, which actually consists of ship owners, charters, brokers, offshore marine companies and, and P&I clubs and underwriters who actually give us a lot of feedback um, about our initiatives and what SCMA should be doing. At the same time, we're also very commercially focused with the kind of arbitrators um, and the kind of panel of arbitrators, which I will deal with a little bit. We are dedicated to this aspect of maritime and trade. We are, as I mentioned, a not-for-profit entity. Um, we are funded by a public-private partnership, the Singapore Maritime Foundation. We are also neutral in the sense we don't have any uh, major lobbies or, or groups dominating. At the same time, we also have a multicultural, multinational panel of arbitrators. Um, and you can also end up choosing a non-panel arbitrator if you decide to uh, use um, the SCMA as a forum. At the same time, we also believe that the cultural sensitivity that we offer uh, over uh, other institutions is very useful, especially with the Asian focus. That is reflected in the arbitration panel as well that we have. 
Finally, we benefit a lot from the Singapore's reputation as being independent and neutral, which is very, very useful when people from different countries are uh, coming together for contracts and they would like to see a fair uh, and independent venue for their arbitration and dispute resolution. Finally, as I mentioned, we have specialist procedures which reduce costs. We give a lot of autonomy to the parties to decide the level of expertise they want in terms of arbitrator choosing, as well as other aspects of the uh, dispute resolution process. And finally, we also have a big advantage with regard to the way uh, everything is in close proximity. Uh, the law firms, the expert witnesses, uh, the parties, if they're all close to each other, obviously the cost structure comes down. Uh, just imagine going all the way to London in a situation like this to try and go ahead and look at uh, a dispute resolution will be quite catastrophic for companies. So obviously we have the proximity advantage as well. Coming to specifically re-emphasizing that we can, um, we can dispute or resolve disputes with any governing law agreed by the parties. So you can have this arbitration in Singapore as per CMA rules with any governing law. We have had in past uh, a lot of English law, some Chinese law and some other uh, legal forums as well. So just think of SCMA. If you take this image back with you, just think of SCMA as a national stadium where you have visiting teams around the world. You bring them in and let them play a match using their own laws. And obviously, all we do is give them an infrastructure to ensure a fair game. So that's a, a very nice analogy which was given by one of our users to us, which we are using now. It's important that you establish the suitability of SCMA to your contract. Uh, the first thing is, what does SCMA offer? As I mentioned, it offers an independent and neutral dispute resolution venue. It uh, offers very close proximity to relevant arbitrators, witnesses, and experts with the benefits and the tax benefits that are given to foreign arbitrators a lot of foreign arbitrators are willing to waive their travel costs to come and arbitrate in singapore which makes them similar to a local arbitrator so that's something which is giving you a lot of benefit as well arbitrating in singapore it's a tested and low cost option with efficient timelines it's an automatic small claim procedure which will help you cap your costs uh, and the fees for the arbitrators are also capped in that case it's an ability to appoint an arbitrator of your choice, panel or non-panel. And finally, people need finality in business. So it's a final and binding solution. It's a fair solution, which will resolve the disputes and parties can move on from there. So that's what SCMA offers today. Um, which contracts are most suitable for using SCMA? A lot of people have asked us this saying that, how do I determine what indicators should I look for in order to try and put SCMA as a relevant uh, dispute resolution forum. So we have come up with six indicators. And if any one of these are actually there in your, um, in your facts or uh, circumstances, please try and look at SCMA. First thing is the parties. If the parties are domiciled and conducting business in Asia, obviously there's no point or no logic going all the way to other parts of the world, uh, Europe or US, for example, to actually go and do a dispute resolution. So it's, you have to do it in a venue which is close to your uh, business area and which is established independent and neutral. SCMA ticks all these boxes. If you have a need for drawing on a vibrant legal and commercial ecosystem, the legal community, trading community, maritime community is vibrant in Singapore. Uh, and obviously that ecosystem is very useful when you are trying to resolve disputes in terms of getting the expertise and local um, knowledge as well. The other aspect is proximity. Your local experts and witnesses are close by, if not in Singapore itself, probably they are in Asia uh, because SCMA does get a lot of Indonesian, Indian and Chinese cases. So obviously parties are not far away from Singapore if they do need to bring people in. The contract uh, is involving a maritime or trade related issue. So it doesn't have to be 100% about trade. If it has an angle, if it has a linkage to trade or maritime, it is worth considering SCMA because of the low cost model that we actually sit with and the flexibility that the model offers. The other aspect is that you have agreed in some cases a contractual uh, requirement to arbitrate in Singapore, but you have not chosen SCMA explicitly those cases also should bring 
uh, yourself to SCMA because we are the most relevant forum for maritime and trade ad hoc cases as well. And finally, if you need somewhere that people will understand the cultural and regional nuances, some of the small aspects about very detailed aspects about doing business and how Asian business is done, SCMA is obviously the most suitable forum for maritime and trade disputes as well. It's important that you realize that the maritime, uh, the SCMA clause needs to be incorporated at the right stage. So I've given you the six stages that normally a contract goes through from the risk management stage and due diligence all the way till closing of the file. And SCMA clauses need to be agreed either in the negotiation stage or in the contract stage, um, the final recap stage. So obviously this is more for maritime related, but it also applies to trade contracts. And it's important that parties remember to incorporate the clauses at the right time. Now, obviously, if you remember to incorporate the clause, you need to know which clause you need to incorporate. It's very common for parties to agree arbitration in Singapore, but does not specify the word SCMA or doesn't talk about it. So it only provides for an ad hoc arbitration. Ad hoc arbitration is actually quite a challenge because there are no rules uh, set off. And at the same time, there's no support by any secretariat and the awards don't carry as much credibility as it would if any specific institution like SCMA is involved in that. So the quick solution is please make sure that you specify explicitly SCMA rules to apply where you believe you want SCMA rules to apply. Um, there is a body like Baltic International Maritime Conference, BIMCO, which is obviously um, able to bring out standard contracts in shipping. Uh, I'm sure there are other bodies uh, which are in trade contracts. There are model clauses available which you can easily access with this quick QR code. These slides in the presentation will be available uh, after this presentation. So please do uh, use this QR code to have the look at the latest SCMA model clauses. The benefit of QR code is that we can actually get the latest clause uh, as they are updated on our website. Now I'll come to some very practical aspects. This is all about SCMA, but it's all about trying to be practical and resolving disputes. First practical aspect is any case that you manage must be managed with an eye on settlement. The business culture in Asia Pacific, I'm sure a lot of people uh, of you are aware, generally has encouraged settlement of disputes. In fact, this settling dispute concept of going to a wise man to resolve your disputes it predates even the court system, which is a, uh, you know, kind of something that came around in colonial times. Uh, most of the SCMA arbitrations do end in settlement and do not reach the final award stage. What we do give as an advantage is the parties wish to settle the matter even after commencing the arbitration. The SCMA has what is called an ARB Med ARB clause, which is an arbitration mediation arbitration clause. So you can actually go and look at mediation midway through an arbitration. And this is something which is more relevant from a psychological point of view, because most of the time, if you do not have a provision like this available in the forum, you are hesitant to go to mediation because you think that that will be a sign of weakness and perceived as a sign of weakness. But having a provision like this, the parties are generally more open to resolving issues while they know that mediation may be now a better way to resolve this conflict. So we actually do have this hybrid solution, which I think has been very, very positive in terms of parties positively looking at mediation, even after arbitration has started. Because we're a low cost model, you have not paid any front loading of fees. You're not paid any fees up front. And therefore, you don't have to worry about big costs incurred already in place. You can still go for mediation, resolve the issue. We can convert that settlement award into an award uh, if that is what is needed. So this is a big, big plus of practically using SCMA to resolve your problems. Second thing, very common with most of the um, counterparties is that if you have a case against a counterparty or you have a dispute, most likely the other party is not responding. Arbitration has become a very effective way of getting non-responsive parties to come to the table. As I mentioned earlier, most of the arbitrations do end in settlements. 
we have made the filing of the arbitration expen uh, costless and hassle-free in SCMA. So again, there is an eARB notify QR code, which is a, a quick scan on your mobile or on your desktop, and you can straight away um, get a quick e-form which you can submit to the secretariat and thereby file for an arbitration immediately and quickly. This is obviously a way of starting the discussion with your non-responsive party. If the party still doesn't respond and you do take all the required precautions, which I think Karina will go through a little bit more in detail, there are specific rules in SCMA uh, rules which actually cater for a situation where there is a non-responsive party. And you can still get an award, but of course you need to make sure that you have followed the required procedures. But this is about dealing with a non-responsive party and how SCMA helps you with that. Some facts and uh, figures on our procedures. Uh, data is very important and we have actually captured as much data as we can. If you do have a settlement, on an average over the last 10 years, it's been about uh, 29 weeks from the date of commencement to discontinuance. That's how the efficiency of the system is at this point of time. If a final award is issued on an average, it takes about a year, depending on the dispute. But if it's a small claim, which is $150,000 and below, um, US dollars, sorry, US dollar $150,000 or below, you actually have only 16 weeks on an average from the date you commence arbitration to the final award. So this is quite a quick procedure, and that is something which needs to be kept in mind. Uh, the fourth aspect is you need to choose one of these specialized procedures in order to be smart. Uh, the small claims procedures, as I mentioned, $150,000 and below. Uh, there's a capping of the arbitrator's fees, so you, it's a very low cost option. There's a specific bunker claim procedure, which is also in place. And so is the expedited arbitral determination of collision claims. In case there are some small collision claims, those are also determined in a quick and expedited manner. Use these procedures because that is something which will help you resolve your disputes faster and in a more cost-effective manner. The fifth aspect of being smart is choosing the right arbitrator panel or non-panel. We have arbitrators, 113 arbitrators on our panel from 17 countries of residence, as you can see, it's a really a big uh, cross-section of across the world. Our vetting process is quite robust with an independent committee deciding on the uh, panel emp empanelment of arbitrators. Um, a lot of the arbitrators do sit on other panels around the globe. So there are a lot of arbitrators who are also London uh, arbitrators sitting on the LMAA or sitting on the SIAC, for example. So you can actually have cross-empanelment situations where you may have a trade or maritime disputes. If you're smart, you can actually, in theory, get the same arbitrator in both sides of your case. That is very, very useful and smart. As I mentioned, some of the overseas arbitrators are happy to waive their travel costs to come and uh, arbitrate in Singapore. That's also very smart. Of course, there are dedicated specialists. And we have divided in our website uh, all the panel members, depending on their specific practice areas and expertise. So you can actually go and check what expertise area you're looking at and see who actually specializes in those areas. That's quite useful. Um, also, there are two law sy legal systems, civil law uh, legal system and the common law system. So obviously, that is something that both uh, law systems have experts in our panel as well. And finally, we are culturally sensitive uh, panel of arbitrators, people from all over the world. Obviously, that's a big, big plus as such. Finally, as I mentioned, parties are completely free to choose uh, and appoint uh, arbitrators outside the panel as well. So there's no restriction to only look at the panel. If you don't find the one that you want here or your arbitrator is not on the panel, please do feel free and you can appoint a non-panel arbitrator as well. Finally, the enforcement and of a final and binding SCMA arbitration award. So currently the SCMA arbitration awards are final and binding. They have no right to appeal on point of law. And that is actually considered as a positive thing, obviously, by parties who can move on uh, and get some finality on their disputes. The arbitration awards, as I mentioned, recognized um, across uh, most jurisdictions through the New York Arbitration Award. 664 countries, over 1,400 court decisions um, have basically been uh, reported, which have been enforcement awards from arbitration awards. So 
this is something which is a time tested scenario and that obviously is a very big plus for both singapore arbitration awards but also for general arbitration awards across the globe we have a very simple mantra that we have in scma for cost effective and efficient dispute resolution we say deal global and dispute local so no 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 surprises here i think if you deal global obviously you're a global company you have to deal global but your dispute is local which is where the efficiency and the cost effectiveness will come into play that's where we are today um, and that's the end of my presentation thank you so very much for your time and uh, and for listening to the presentation i know there are already a few questions that i can see um, but obviously i would then pass this on to corina uh, and request her to come in and uh, and see which particular slides she wants me to revisit uh, as she discusses further on this issue thanks corina and thank you so much thanks bonnie Hi, good morning everyone. I do not have any specific slides um, for my segment of the presentation, but what I will endeavour to do is to add or make some observations on some of the slides which um, Punit has actually walked you through a couple of minutes ago. So if I could maybe just ask Punit to please pull out slide number four, um, where he had briefly talked about um, the possible types of disputes that can arise in shipping and trade. Um, I think he mentioned insolvency. Now for insolvency, I don't think those types of disputes would typically go before um, an arbitral tribunal because as you would have seen from the press in the past couple of days, for example, disputes involving the owners' ocean tankers or disputes involving silver holdings, these have all gone before the courts. Now, in a situation where the company has already gone in for some kind of court protection in Singapore, um, there is typically a moratorium that's worked into the order as well. So even if you've got court proceedings or even if you've got arbitration proceedings, you would not be able to continue with those, neither would you be able to um, commence fresh proceedings. More commonly, the sort of um, cases that I would deal with in my practice would be... Um, what I call demurrage cases. So delays at port, this is a very common type of um, case. Port congestion is one example as to how delays can arise. And once the agreed lay time has been utilized, the vessels will go on demurrage and the claims in this category uh, be something which I come across quite frequent um, in practice that ends up in arbitration. The dispute can arise out of a fixture note or out of a sale contract for say, you know, sale of um, coal cargo or petrochemicals. Another category of claims that's actually quite um, common is so, seal contracts and um, COVID-19 situation now, I have seen a, car a sudden emergence of um, cases where people, particularly buyers, who are trying to get out of um, bad deals where they are relying on a force majeure clause on the basis of COVID. And they are trying to avoid, obviously, or postpone their obligations to take delivery of the cargoes. To give you just some context, one recent example I acted for a seller um, who had sold some petrochemicals on a CIF basis to receivers in India. The vessel had already commenced loading of the first shipment and was nearly um, near completion and the buyer then wrote to them and said okay there's force majeure situation and in India no person is allowed to board or disembark a vessel until further instructions but of course the client then looked at investigated the situation a bit more closely in India and realized that there was in fact a director general of shipping um, regulation or direction that had been passed which expressly said that the operation of seaports for cargo movements is not affected. So business is as usual for imports because they needed certain types of cargoes to keep um, various sectors going. Another type of, um, another dispute, which is in a slightly different part of the world, was where I also acted for another seller of petrochemical products and they had sold it to um, this cargo, it been sold to someone in China. And again, the buyer tried to rely on COVID and said, force mature, 
But what they actually did was because they couldn't sell all their cargo, they actually stopped manufacturing at the plant. And they said that breakdown of machinery, and therefore this falls within our force mention clause. So you get all sorts of um, excuses where people try to um, rely on force majeure these days. Um, and these are, some of them have already been resolved. Some are still on the way in arbitration. Um, these two examples that I've given you, they are actually not SCMA arbitrations. One of them had chosen in the contract to proceed via SIAC, and the other one had chosen to proceed via ICC. Um, I will talk a little bit more about that later on, but um, I think Punit has briefly explained to you what's the difference between the SIAC model and the SCMA model. Now, the other types of contracts that one frequently sees um, incorporating arbitration clauses for SEMA arbitration clauses especially would be ship repair contracts, shipbuilding contracts, and MOAs um, for sale and purchase of second-hand tonnage vessels. So as you can see, there's actually quite a wide variety of um, claims that will fall under this broad description of maritime and trade disputes. Um, if Punit could maybe just pull up the next slide, his, I think it's slide number five. Yes, thank you, Punit. I think you had mentioned earlier on that the dispute resolution clause typically receives the least attention during negotiations. When you're trying to close a deal, nobody is thinking that, okay, you know, we're likely to have a big fight or a dispute over it. That's the last thing on anyone's mind. But when a dispute does in fact arise, the last thing you want to do is to be faced with yet another issue of how or where to go to resolve your dispute. Let me show you one recent example of a, what I would call a half-baked type of an arbitration clause in a case that I recently advised on. If you look at the top one, for example, all disputes, controversies, or difference which may arise between the parties out of or in relation to or in connection with this CP or for the breach thereof shall be finally settled in Singapore in English law and the award rendered by arbitrator shall be final and binding upon both parties. So when a dispute arose in the context of this charter party, the parties couldn't even decide where to have it resolved, what rules to apply. So I was then consulted. So the first problem with this is if you look at clause 23, it appears to contemplate arbitration in Singapore, but the arbitration agreement is not entirely clear because it doesn't even refer to arbitration in the clause itself. It only refers to the word award. But I think on balance, if the Singapore court was to have a look or have to determine this clause, it would probably decide that the parties intended to arbitrate. The second problem with this is it doesn't make any reference to any institutional rules. So this case would then be treated as an ad hoc arbitration and the reference would have to be made to the Singapore International Arbitration Act. The third problem with this is, if you notice, it is very silent on the number of days or the number of arbitrators that the parties intended. So again, you would have to go back to the model law or the International Arbitration Act to seek guidance and that may be a problem. The next clause, any dispute arising out of or in connection with this contract shall be submitted to Singapore for arbitration by English law in accordance with the existing arbitration rules of the arbitration centre and the arbitration shall be final and binding upon the parties. Now, this clause seems a little bit better. This came out of another charter party as well. But the problem here is it attempts to incorporate some arbitration or institutional rules. But the question is, which set of rules? Rules of the arbitration center. Now, in Singapore, as you know, we've got the SCMA and we've got the SIAC. So which one was actually intended by the parties in this scenario? Big question mark. So they couldn't decide in this case, and they ended up having to make an appointment under the Section 8.2 of the International Arbitration Act. And at the end of the day, the matter was um, the, the sole arbitrator was appointed by the appointing body and the rules that were incorporated or relied upon was the SIAC rules, which I will take you to shortly, actually resulted in fees being paid up front and one of the parties actually wasn't too happy about that. Um, the next 
So these are just examples of um, two clauses that I've seen. Now, let me suggest to you that if any of you out there are thinking that perhaps you want to incorporate an arbitration agreement, go to the SDMA website. There are two types of uh, model clauses there. One is what I would call the short form. If you look at this one, which Punit has just uh, flashed on the screen, you will see that it's short and it refers expressly to Singapore arbitration and it refers to the um, arbitration rules of the Singapore Chamber of Maritime Arbitration. And if you look in the rules of the Singapore Chamber of Maritime Arbitration, it provides for, for example, an appointment of a, a tribunal of three men to hear the dispute and then various other timelines are provided in the rules which will automatically apply. If you wish to have a slightly longer form, there is also the BIMCO clause, which I think Punit had made a um, brief mention to. For those of you who are not quite familiar with BIMCO, um, it's actually a member's organization for ship owners, charterers, brokers, and agents. And it has quite a broad um, base membership of about 1,900 members across the world. And they are like a depository of um, all the major shipping forms for different types of charter parties. And these are all stored on a, a BIMCO database that you can access, um, I think, from member companies for upon payment of a, a fee. And that clause is slightly longer. I'm not sure if Punit has got that as well on the um, on screen, but that details the number of arbitrators that you have chosen. No, that, that, that's on our website, uh, Karina. But yeah, the, that is more detailed and more specific to maritime disputes. Yes. Yes. Okay, so if you're interested, then check out the, um, the QR code that um, Punit flashed on earlier, and that will take you to the right page where you'll be able to find the, um, the relevant BIMCO clause for SCMA. If I could just trouble put it, go on to maybe slide number 12. Yep. Just, just a minute. few observations on this slide. This one? Thank you. That's right. Oh. You flossed it, I think. Yep. Yep. Yes, this one. Thank you. Just very quickly, that um, although on the, if you look at the left hand column, although the SCMA does not charge a case filing or an administrative fee, administration fee, I should highlight that there is an appointment fee, for example, if you utilize the services of the chairman of the CMA to help you appoint an arbitrator, but it's a very nominal fee of only $750 sim per party or $1,500 if there are two parties. And if one of the parties do not pay, then you have to pay the full $1,500 in order to get the appointment letter released by the uh, chamber. But that is only in a case where you have a respondent that's not responding and is not able to um, and you're not able to proceed with the arbitration until the tribunal is properly constituted. There is also a very small nominal fee of $500 that's payable upon the appointment of an arbitrator under the SCMA rules. Now, under the SIAC side, you will see that there are case filing fees which automatically kick in when you file your notice. Now, I just want to highlight here that for shipping matters, some of you may be aware that there are very short time bar or timelines that need to be preserved and protected either be with the issuance of a writ in the High Court in order to protect the time bar or alternatively by instituting or commencing arbitration proceedings. Now, if you imagine you've got a cargo claim, for example, with a 12-month time bar, if you were under the SIAC regime, Immediately, you put in your notice of arbitration, you have to pay those fees. If you actually had an SCMA arbitration, you would not be incurring such substantial fees because you only have at most a nominal $500 fee that's payable. Now, under the SIAC framework, you will see that there is a percentage fee apart from the 
case filing fee, there is an administration fee payable to the institution for managing or supervising the proceedings. On top of that, there is the arbitrator's fee. So if you have an arbitrator, one arbitrator, you pay one set of fees. If you have a tribunal of three men, you would then have to take those fees times three because you'll have to pay three men for doing the job. Just to give you a better picture and some guidelines, for a claim of say $1 million SING, okay, you would be looking at SIAC administration fees of 14,700 SING and arbitrator's fees of 63,400. So there is a schedule of fees you can work out that is the, the percentage varies depending on the size of the claim. So for a claim of say $10 million SING, you would be looking at administration fees of 38,800 payable to the institution only, and an arbitrator's fee of 161,900 sing for one man. So you can imagine if you have three, you would have to times three, and that's almost 550,000. And that's quite a lot of money. Now, the other differences between the two um, regimes, the SCMA and the SIAC ones, is that um, under the SCMA rules, we have a fixed timeline under the existing rules for service of your claim, your defense, and your counterclaim. So currently, it's fixed at 30 days, 30 days, and 30 days. Versus the SIAC one, where the rules provide that the tribunal will be in control and the tribunal will set down the time frames as to how fast or how slow the proceedings should proceed. Now, I should just mention that the SCMA rules are currently under um, review. There is a consultation paper that was um, dispatched, I think, about eight weeks ago, and we are still in the consultation process. And in the consultation paper, what has been proposed after hearing views and feedback from users over the past couple of years is that the um, 30 days may be a bit too long. Because if you have 30, 30, and 30, it takes you 90 days from start to not even finish, but to just get to the hearing stage. So what is being proposed is to half all of that. So we wanted to reduce that to 14 days each, which would take us to about 42 days before you get to the commencement of the hearing stage. But the jury is still out. We're still waiting to hear from all of you. We're very interested. If anyone has any views, please, um, check out the SCMA website. I think there is a link to the consultation paper. We would love to hear your views. Now, um, Punit has also mentioned that there is an auto access to the quicker small claims procedure under our SCMA rules versus the SIAC one, which has an expedited procedure that you need to apply for. Now, the current SCP procedure under the SCMA rules has a limit of about 150,000 US dollars. The consultation paper that we have rolled out, we are seeking views on whether this should actually be increased. Because 150,000 in today's world is very, very small. We are proposing that it be increased to 400,000. The rules or the time frames for the SCP procedure is much more compact. So you should be able to get to your, um, to your judgment or your award within like a period of one month. So there are pros and cons. Currently, it auto applies. So even if you don't even know about its existence, but you're subscribed to the SCMA rules, you will be bound by that. Some people are not very happy with that. They would rather opt in. So if you have any views, again, do come back and let us know. The reason why we are thinking of changing it and increasing the limit is because for example, demarrage claims. Hardly would you come across a demarrage claim of 150,000. In this day and age, most of it would be probably between 300 to 600,000. It may be too small to go for a full-blown hearing, but on the other hand, for companies who trade regularly, it may be too large to keep writing off three to $500,000 claims because collectively, you could be looking at a few million dollars in a year, and that's quite a lot of money for any company. Let me just see. <clears throat> I think those are all my comments on this particular slide. Um, 
if I could then trouble put it to maybe go on to slide um, <clears throat> 23. This one? Yes, 23. I think Punit had mentioned that in certain cases where you have a non-responsive party, you can still proceed with the arbitration because of the rules. I just, I just wanted to highlight that as an arbitrator or even as counsel in cases where I actually come across a non-responsive party, you do actually have to be a little bit more vigilant because there's always the fear that even if you do get to an award, you may not be able to successfully enforce that award in another jurisdiction. And many non-responsive kind of parties come from countries like, say, Vietnam, Bangladesh, Indonesia. And it is very difficult because if you get to the enforcement stage after having spent all that money on the award, only to hear that it's not enforceable because you have not taken certain steps, um, then that would be quite dire for the company involved. So as counsel or as arbitrator, what I would typically do is give them as much opportunity as possible to respond. So for example, even if you set the hearing date, make sure that they are informed via a letter sent by courier, inform them by the telephone, tell the council to call them, to notify them, inform them via email, and make sure that you don't get an undelivered um, message on the email machine. On the day of the hearing, before you start, when I sit as arbitrator, I will also always um, ensure and tell the other party, can you please call them in my presence, make sure that we have given him all opportunity, make, do a short adjournment for say 20 minutes, make sure that he actually comes back so that he has no excuse and all of this will be recorded and you will actually make reference to this in your award to make sure that he's had fair opportunity, not on one occasion only, but on numerous occasions to participate, but that he has failed to do so and he basically does it at his own peril. And I think all of this helps at the enforcement stage. Moving on to the next slide, I think, um, I think it's slide 27 for me. Just a few observations or comments about this um, right of appeal that Punit talked about and how awards are final and binding. For some of you, you may be aware that um, sometime last year in June, the Ministry of Law issued a consultation paper seeking feedback, uh, feedback on various amendments to the Singapore International Arbitration Act. Now, one of these amendments include the right of appeal. The right of appeal amendment has really given, up, um, given rise to quite lively debate. And although the consultation paper closed, I think it was sometime in August last year, if I'm not mistaken, the ministry has not yet come back with the, um, the finalized bill or basically what the, the amendments would look like. But let me just talk a little bit about the amendment with regards to the right of appeal. So Singapore law currently does not provide any right of appeal under the IEA. What we do have are provisions allowing for the setting aside of an award where there is fraud, corruption, or where there's, a, there's been a breach of natural justice or under Section 342A of the model law. Unlike the UK, where they have provisions providing um, for a right of appeal and what is being proposed in Singapore is for the right of appeal to be introduced, but you need to sign up for it. So you need to opt in for it. So even if the Singapore um, Parliament passed the laws in relation to the right of appeal, it is not an automatic right. Furthermore, under the proposed amendments, Section 24A, the leave to, a right to appeal may only be given under in four circumstances. First, where the determination of the question will substantially affect the rights of one or more of the parties. B, where the question is one that the tribunal has been asked to determine. C, on the basis of the findings of fact, the decision is so obviously wrong, or the question is one of general public importance, and the tribunal's decision is at least open to serious doubt. And D, it is just improper in all circumstances for the court to determine the question. Now you may ask, why is it so difficult to have this right of appeal? Primarily, it is because 
of this principle of party autonomy. When the parties choose and decide to arbitrate the dispute, there is one quarter that believes that then you should stick with your choice. If you have chosen Mr. A or a tribunal of three men to decide your dispute, then you should live with the decision. You should not be unhappy with that. That's really one side of the point. The other part of it is, if you were to open the floodgate, so to speak, for a right of appeal, some people fear that there will be so many appeals that the courts would be jammed with cases. But experience shows from the UK statistics that this is actually not the case. The number of cases that have actually reached the highest court, the Supreme Court in the UK, is very minimal. It's less than, I think, 10%. And that's for such a large country. And the numbers are like probably, if I recall off the top of my head, less than 20 in number. Finality also used to be a very important consideration for many users of um, arbitration. But over the years, as a result of the um, various surveys that have been taken, I think the, the results show that finality is not so important nowadays. It is still one of the considerations, but I think people feel that the decision needs to be correct at the end of the day. One last thought on the right of appeal is, Punit had mentioned earlier on that um, parties have the right a freedom to choose whatever governing law that they are familiar with um, and use SCFA or SIAC rules. You can choose English law, for example, which is the most common law. Or you could, you know, if you prefer, you could have Japanese or Korean law. But it bears noting that if we get this right of appeal and with the new amendments, this right of appeal will only apply to cases where the parties have chosen Singapore law as the governing law of the contract. It does not apply to Japanese or English law or whatever other system of law that you may have decided to opt, in, opt for in your contract. But let me leave you with some food for thought here because many of you may have heard of the Singapore International Commercial Court. It was newly established in 2015 in Singapore. And we have a very impressive panel of judges from all over the world, from Australia, Japan, Germany, India, England. Now, is it not possible for us to then consider having this right of appeal extended to other systems of law, but where the appeals would be heard by experts from those jurisdictions before the Singapore International Commercial Court instead of the usual High Court? So again, the jury is still out on this. I don't know what the answer is, but I'll just leave on that note. I'll just leave that with you to mull over. Put it over back to you. Thank you so much, Corina. These are all very practical ways to look at these things. I can just give you this last uh, rehash slide that uh, our our mantra is still global. Thank you so much for the time and the support and obviously we are very happy to take questions um, on this as well yeah thank you so much thank you Puneet and and Karina um, I, I, I just want to ask a couple of questions um, as the moderator and as a layman before yeah. we we jump into the the some of the questions in the Q&A uh, feed um, one of your slides Puneet said that quite a few arbitrations end in settlement and never reach their end. Yep. Uh, does that mean that they're settled and then there's, because they're settled, there's no need for an award? Correct. Have I got that right? Exactly. So that is how it is. They are not, there are no awards needed uh, because the settlement has happened after the arbitrations have proceeded halfway through or, or a little bit more than that. Yeah. Okay, great. And my second question very quickly is, I mean, COVID-19, is that regarded uh, as force mayeur? I would imagine it would be because it's, you know, outside anybody's control. Yep. Corina, would you, would you answer that one uh, as to whether COVID-19 is a force mayeur event? Or? Victor, I think the buyers would love you, but I think <laughs> it does not ordinarily, 
it does not ordinary in a, in a standard clause most people have not provided for pandemics but i think generally um given the current situation many in-house counsel are probably very busy reviewing all the standard term contracts especially fm clauses in trying to expand that but of course you know the covid-19 situation is unprecedented i mean when you put in a, a force majeure clause most people would be thinking of um factory shutdown strikes um type um monsoons earthquakes things yes. like that even when we had sars i don't think it actually hit us as badly as what we are now witnessing today i mean being well not in lockdown but being out of the office for almost 6 months that's really unheard of <laughs> yes i mean it's uh, the sort of sense of reasonableness would suggest that even if even if a contract doesn't cover pandemics given the extraordinary um global reach of covid-19 and the economic fallout globally of covid-19 it could well fall under force majeure yeah i i can just add one small point from a commercial perspective is that most of the force majeure clauses do have a additional wording in the end saying and any other causes whatsoever beyond control of the parties and whether that kind of all encompassing um, uh, remainder clause or wording is good enough to to look at it i think the jury is still out completely on it but corina you can probably comment on that kind of a clause which you must come across quite often yeah well i think for mostly sellers i would say no <laughs> it doesn't cover <laughs> <laughs> i think it needs to be read in the context of the preceding words before that not right. just you know just because it covers everything else because then it would be too wide and i yes. think in the cases that i've encountered i mean i've got three active ones ongoing now i think it is quite clear that it's really not a case of the covid-19 um affecting the the receipt of the cargo at the discharge ports because the ports were obviously still operating but it's because the prices had um had dropped significantly and people were finding ways and means to get out of those contracts and in fact in one of those cases there was involved in we found out on the sideline that the chap was actually buying from another source the same product at a cheaper price <laughs> my goodness yeah so yes. it's it's actually quite bad never underestimate the ingenuity of business people <laughs> okay let's let's go to the q and a box uh, and kick off with lily's question so how do we decide in a contract if we should use one arbitrator or three is there a standard practice Okay let me try to answer that for the lead um mm -hmm. of course there are pros and there are cons if you've got a very huge multi million dollar contract and obviously you're going to pay three men for their time on the tribunal um it would not look so it would not look dispor disproportionate mm -hmm. if you have a 300000 dollar dispute and you have to pay each man let's say even a cheap arbitrator might easily cost you 40 50000 times 3 that's half of the size of the claim that's quite a lot of money to be paying just for the arbitrator so i think you need to consider what is actually appropriate for your type of um, dispute as to whether or not it should be three or whether it should be one if you go under the um, scma rules the default position is three arbitrators If you go under the um, ad hoc provision which is the Singapore International Arbitration Act the default position is a sole arbitrator but if you don't like a sole arbitrator because you think oh you know if he doesn't like you or you know you start off on the wrong footing then that's it you know he's had it for you until the end um then you may want to have three the choice is really um, up to the um the user as to what they are comfortable with and i must mention here that the current public consultation that is going on does talk about possibility of or does invite views on changing that default setting from 3 to 1 arbitrator for scma rules in future as well so we would love to yes. hear from people uh, and users on their views on what should be the default position in scma rules because that's very important going forward as well yeah that's But right and i think the reason for the if i may add the reason why we have included that in the consultation paper was because we had received feedback and people were some were a little bit unhappy because they said that 
having a default of three arbitrators is very expensive for most users. And, and, and just generically, I think what happens is depends on the kind of contract you're sitting with. If you have a multi-million dollar contract, as Corina said, I think it makes sense to actually have more than one arbitrator. So I think the answer would be to look at the actual value of the contract and then decide. The parties are free also, to decide. Yeah. It also depends very much on the parties because if the parties are sensible, sometimes I've seen contracts which provide for three arbitrators. And the amount in dispute is not a lot. Even at $1 million today, most people would consider that to be quite small because legal costs, arbitration costs can actually spiral quite quickly. So even in those cases, sometimes people are quite commercially minded. They say, okay, we've got a dispute, but instead of having three men, why don't we agree to one? And if both parties agree, there's nothing to stop the parties from just appointing a sole arbitrator. Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, Ah, we have a we have a, a upvoted question, and it's also from Lily. Um, it's back to Force Mayeur, which is: Have you updated Force Mayeur to incorporate COVID nineteen? The That's short it. answer, the short answer is no. Mm -hmm. I suspect that the general counsel, the in house counsel of the clients that I've been doing some work for, they are probably looking at that themselves internally. Okay. Yeah. Now, can I invite you to have a look at Robin's question? I appreciate you, you can't give specific legal advice because you haven't got all the facts and you haven't been appointed to give the legal advice, but are there any comments that you would like to make? Um, because Robin has um, spent a lot of time typing a long uh, message yep. in the Q&A box. Um, yes, I will endeavor to give some comment on that. Basically, Thank you. I think what he is saying is that how should he go about or whether he should adopt SCMA um, arbitration for this particular dispute. So the first point I would make is if you have not already got an arbitration clause in your contract, you would not be able to go to arbitration because it basically takes two to tango for arbitration. You need to have both parties having pre-agreed to refer the matter to arbitration. The second point is, if the two parties are now in agreement, which is most like, unlikely if you already have a dispute room, but if they are in agreement, then they can proceed to arbitrate the dispute, even in the absence of a, a clause. So that's still possible. So beyond that, I'm not going to attempt to answer the rest of his questions about legal action and all that, no. Understood. Thank you very much indeed. Um, now we come back to Lily, who is super active in the Q&A. Thank you, Lily. Um, so Lily says, contracts usually involve a minimum of three parties, seller, buyer, and end receivers. Do we need to ensure one arbitration location for all, or is this not necessary? Okay, that's a very good um, question. There are a few parts um, mingled or mixed into that. So let me just try to break this part. Um, in this would typically happen from my own experience in two types of cases. First, charter party disputes. So where you've got a head owner, means the registered owner of the ship, then you've got a charterer at the second level, then you've got a sub-charterer below him. And in many other cases, you would have a sub-sub-charterer or a sub-sub-sub-charterer all the way down. Now, in a case like that, if you have a dispute, of course, it would be very beneficial if it is a related dispute where everyone is asking for indemnity to have it all resolved in one uh, venue or before the same tribunal. Now, another scenario where this may occur would be in a sale contract. So, for example, I am the supplier. I sell to Punit, say 10,000 metric tons of coal. Punit sells to Victor the same 10,000. Right? And if all three of us end up in a dispute, would I be wanting to have my dispute with Punit resolved in London in arbitration, then Punit's dispute with Victor resolved in Australia or Singapore or somewhere else with three different men? You would end up potentially having different findings. And in fact, findings which may be inconsistent with each other, then how do you get the indemnity or seek indemnity up the chain to the person ultimately responsible? So these are the two now, the way to deal with this, there are ways. you could either have rules that already apply or 
provide for consolidation of cases provided you are in the same venue. If it's not the case, what you could do is to try, it's not a perfect solution, but you could try to appoint the same arbitrator in the next arbitration that you're involved in down the chain. So if, for example, between Pune and myself, I've appointed, say, Mr. X for an arbitration, right, and he's appointed Mr. Y, he may want to appoint the same person in this tribunal in the arbitration between Pune and Victor. So that same person would actually be able to follow and know what are the inconsistencies that are being raised in each form. Yeah, that makes, that but, makes yeah. sense. But Lily's question is very, very um, apt because one of the things which Pune would admit as well that we struggle with is charter party disputes. Um, it is very difficult for Singapore or for SCMA at the middle stage to jump in and persuade people to incorporate Singapore law and Singapore um, Chamber of Maritime Arbitration clauses. Why? Because if the head owner has already incorporated LMAA, which is the London Maritime Arbitration Clause at the top, more likely than not, the guys at the bottom chain are all going to cut, copy and paste because they don't want to end up having inconsistent um, decisions and findings. So unless we are able to attack at the top, then the, the rest will follow suit. Absolutely. And, and I'd just like to add one more point here. Recently, we've come across cases where there's been one single party who has defaulted and there are four uh, claimants who are claiming against that party. They are actually very happy coming all together and, and having one set of arbitrators for all the four cases. So they've all, all the parties have come together and said, we are happy with one set of arbitrators dealing with all our four claims against this one party. That is also another reason where you can actually centralize your arbitrations if possible. And as I mentioned, especially when you have ad hoc arbitrations, do not have uh, specifically SCMA mentioned, but are relevant within maritime and trade, you can consolidate them and put them into SCMA by just agreeing that as well. So there is a potential of clubbing the cases together and also trying to make sure that the arbitration venue is uniform as much as possible. Uh, but but that is, that is uh, to answer Lily's question specifically, yes, it would be beneficial to have it like that, but it's not practical all the time. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Thank you. Lily has another question. She does. And <laughs> that question is, if it's not incorporated into the contract, rules are to be used, is there by default that SIAC will be the first preferred option? Okay, let me try to um, take that question. Again, I think it's a very good question. One of the um, sample arbitration agreement clauses that I had put it, helped me flesh out earlier on, that was actually one of those that went before the appointing body under Section 8.2 of the International Arbitration Act where we had no rules agreed upon, and I mentioned that it went to the SIAC. Now, under Section 8.2, the default appointing authority there is the President of the Court of International Arbitration, which is part of SIAC. Now, many people have wondered and viewed that the perception being, oh, you know, SIAC is like the preferred body, which is why Section 8.2 actually provides for the, them to be the appointment body, appointing body. But I think you need to take a step back and look at when that provision was actually introduced. Now, if I'm not wrong, that, in, that provision was introduced as long ago as about 15 years ago. When SCMA was still part of SIAC, we were basically a maritime desk within the institution SIAC. We had not yet reached the milestone 2009 and we had not yet been constituted as an independent body. So when they made subsequent amendments to Section 8.2 of the International Arbitration Act, they only amended it because in the old days, before they set up the Court of International Arbitration at the SIAC, the person that was actually um, responsible for appointing was the chairman of the SIAC. So that's the only change. And I don't think anyone has actually looked and thought about, oh, why is it just 
SIAC that's preferred or you know referred to in section 82. So to answer Lady's question, SIAC is not the preferred body or the preferred rules to choose. Um, they deal or they cater to different sectors of um, industry and businesses. We are more shipping, maritime and trade focused. You will see that SIAC actually deals with a lot of um, building, construction, joint venture type of disputes. And of course, they also have a pocket of trade cases which have inevitably got shipping aspects in it. And because of that, they've actually also set up their own specialized panel um, of arbitrators that um, have some expertise in shipping and trade disputes. So in that case where the matter was referred to the SIAC, uh, sorry, the Court of International Arbitration for an appointment of an arbitrator, the parties, after the arbitrator had been appointed, the parties would then have to decide which set of rules they wanted to incorporate or rely on, either SIAC or SCMA. And in that case, they actually chose SIAC. So it became a supervised and administered type of um, arbitration. Okay, thank you. Um, Sue Kuhn has got a question. Can you share how fast SCMA was able to settle past arbitration cases and how, um, how is this benchmarked with cases in other countries? I think you covered some of this in your presentation. Um, I have, yeah, I have. Uh, I, I just say that I think the, the actual duration of the case uh, is definitely dependent on how complex it is and, and how the parties do actually agree to go with the responsiveness of it. But in general, as we have shown with the data in the last 10 years, it's been fairly efficient process, especially if it's small claims. Um, and on an average, a settlement of the uh, case uh, is, is a little bit over six months if you parties do settle. But if it does go to the final award stage, about a year is, is, is definitely uh, quite an average number um, and fairly efficient in, in that respect. Uh, I don't have exact figures from other venues, but uh, we can, of course, come back to you at a later stage on that as well, for sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Robin's come back with a question. Um, if my clause in the current agreement states B-A-N-I in Indonesia, is there any hope or chance to do the arbitration in Singapore instead? For example, if B-A-N-I has ceased taking cases because of COVID-19? Um, I, like I said earlier on to Robin, I think what you need to do is you would need to approach the, your counterparty and try to um, reach an agreement to change the arbitration venue or the arbitral institution. That's the only way that you're going to be able to do that. It may be that you know, he's just avoiding you because he just doesn't want you to pursue him in arbitration. Quite positive. Well, thank you for that. And we, we, we've come to the end of the questions and to the end of this morning's webinar. So a big thank you to Bunit and Karina for shedding some light on the SCMA model and how that differs from other models and the benefits to business in terms of cost, time, uh, and um, access. So thank you both very much indeed. I think it's been very, very useful. Thank um, you so very much, Victor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victor, for organizing this. It's a pleasure. Thank, thank you for, for being here with us. And I'd like to thank the members of the audience too. For Absolutely. Your, uh, presence, your attention, and your questions. Thank you very much. It was very, very good. Thank you so much, and please stay safe. <laughs> and that's all I can say. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Thank Goodbye. you. And if, if there's anything that the, the chamber can do for you, please don't hesitate to drop us a line to here to help at sicc.com.sg. So it's goodbye from all of us, and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.